Good evening, good to know, It's a pleasure to be here. I think it was 1992 when I was invited, maybe by you guys down there, to the <laughs> uh, Alvarado Symposium in Ueskile. And there I heard your lecture on animal architecture. 92, could be. <laughs> OK. So we have heard each other, but I never had the opportunity to ask you any personal questions. OK? Please have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, it's not rehearsed. He doesn't know what I'm going to ask. <laughs> You'll be surprised. <laughs> so will you. <laughs> <laughs> if you look back, is there a space? of a house, of a building, which when you look back, you could say this is the first space which influenced me, where I felt there's something special in this space. Maybe be even before you knew that there's such a thing like architecture. Would you like to talk about this, this experience? Yes. That is the farmhouse in which I lived as a young boy during the war years. There were two uh, places which I understood or experienced as spaces. One was the space underneath the entrance uh, veranda, which was so low that only chickens, uh, the dog, uh, uh, the cat and myself. Could How old were you? I was uh, between uh, four and seven. And um, the other space, uh, and uh, I have written about this space. Then the second. Okay, see, I should uh, I should read your books. Pardon me. I should read your books. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, then the second one was the attic of the house, which I have realized later that uh, they were my first library, that space was my first library and museum. They were old newspapers which were on the floor with uh, sawdust saw, uh, as uh, heat insulation. They were old objects. Uh, there were also, there were, were two books of uh, wallpaper patterns in the war years when there, was, there were no books, journals, Nothing. Wallpapers. Wallpapers. I studied those. And the third space that I still remember strongly was the close, uh, narrow space between the cowhouse and the sauna. I realized this is a space. And those three space, spatial this experiences are strong. How is this when you are between, how old were you? Uh, I was, as I said, between, between uh, four and four and four and so seven. So when you say when you say this is the first time I realized that this is a space, this sounds like looking back. Do you remember? Like you're a grown up looking back. Can you? How was the experience then, as a young boy? I'm sure you didn't think this is no, a space. No, no, I, 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 I didn't think. Uh, I felt. Uh, I felt. I, I always felt the first. A moment of being at home in my grandfather's house when I passed that narrow passage between the sauna and the cowhouse. So I understood the message of that narrow space. You are understanding? Are you, are you understanding or feeling? Well, I understood it through my feeling. I, no. uh, I understood the welcome. I'm trying to get you as a boy and not as a thinker. Yes, <laughs> I, I know Can what you, you are saying. Can you try again, please, no. to... <laughs> to the, it, this must have been a great experience. So, can you... What was it, this experience? Small, dark, light, smelly? So, so, well, well so, 
the first one, the space underneath the veranda, that was small. Uh, then the uh, attic was almost immense or, uh, uh, in, in size. And the other one, again, the space between the sauna and the cowhouse, that was intimate and welcoming and a kind of a portal that marked. Uh, I, I use these, I under, realize that these words are afterthoughts, yeah, yeah, but sure. the experiences are real. It's original. Yes. So I torture you once more. So the original experience gave you what feeling as a boy? They were, home, they, they were feelings. Mm -hmm. they, they were feelings. Of course, uh, everything very much um, related with the experience of, uh, of home and uh, the, uh, how would I say, the size of the home because the home uh, perhaps initially was uh, just the interior but then it okay. gradually expanded. Uh, even the village nearby, not nearby, four kilometers away, uh. Uh, later felt like, like home. And uh, then I understood in my childhood that be beyond the uh, forest line, there is the world. I never realized, of course, that I would travel uh, now 104 times around okay, that world. So where do you think is your home now? Uh, do you still have a home? Yes, I do have home. Uh, the home becomes increasingly condensed uh, to these initial uh, experiences. Maybe this is an indiscreet question. How does your home look and feel? And you don't have to answer if you don't want, right? Well, no, 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 <laughs> I, I, I can answer. Uh, you probably know the, the uh, theologian, uh, Teilhard de Chardin. I do. Yes. He has, in his books, uh, he speaks of a magical uh, point which he calls omega. And he defines omega as the point from which the world looks whole, uh, looks complete and right. For me, that's what home is. This was the definition of home, but I asked you something else. Do you know what I asked? I, <laughs> you said you're an intellectual, but let I catch you. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I asked you how concretely your home is. That's why I say you don't have to. If you say that's a private thing, I'm not going to talk about it. Fine. But material is it. What, what is it? What your home? What do you like in your home? Well, on one hand, home is a specific place, but for people like you and myself who have traveled so much, it becomes also uh, something non-material. In a way, you carry your home, the idea of home, with you. Yeah. Uh, for instance, whenever I enter a new hotel room, I throw certain objects on the bed, no. declaring it my home for the time being. Can so I, it's the process no. of domestication that you... Well, okay, you stay an intellectual for the rest of your life, that's clear. All right. <laughs> you are not going to answer my question, I can see this. Yeah. Why, don't okay. you, why don't you answer it on, on, on I will. your I will. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like to sit in a space and have a wall in my back. So that's what I built for myself for the second time. I like this. I think this is a fantastic feeling. I'm sitting here and I'm protected in the back. And then in the front, I would like to look at the sea, but I don't have it. <laughs> I would like to look at the fantastic mountains, but this I don't have, I'm too low, <laughs> I'm living too low. But what I now have is a garden. And this garden is pure luxury to me, it makes me quiet. 
I have to tell you, I don't, I know nothing about plants, unfortunately. But just to be with these plants in front of me, protected, and then some kind of music there. And when I sit there, to the left, I go three steps up the kitchen. Okay, <laughs> and to my right, I go two shallow steps up. What to a place called the Stube. The Stube. So I'm, you see, I, I, I'm in the middle of, I'm here, I'm working here. Kitchen there, Stube there. Kitchen, big window, sink, and so on. Corner bench. Extremely important for me. A corner bench where my family can come. I think this is the, I know what, the greatest institution. Uh, now I'm triggering you. Okay, I say one more thing. Stube has to be in wood and needs a fireplace. Okay, this was not a, now as you see, this maybe it was a misunderstanding. It's not a definition, it's how it is. How is it? Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> yes, well, uh, in, in uh, the house of my youth, there was also a corner, be a corner bench. We the from corner the same bench family, was next to the, to the <laughs> exterior door, uh. and that was where anyone entering was supposed to sit uh. Uh, for 20 minutes, quiet. He would first take off, off his fur hat, but then sit quiet. That's a Finnish custom a to Finnish, be quiet, yes. right? <laughs> and then af after that 20 minutes, he but would explain know that why in he entered. Europe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. everything was also wood. I still remember the, the uh, wooden, wood table made of uh, huge, huge, uh, huge uh, tree trunk. Oh. Yes. So our childhood uh, homes have some common elements, it seems. I want a uh, question. Could it be that we all come from houses? All of us? From houses? I don't suppose so. Uh, most of the they think they young grew up people in the come, forest? From, from, mm -hmm. come from apartments, which is a yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, we all come from, how would you call it, spaces or yes. uh, family homes or a place where we grow up. Yes, but for me, house is something that... Uh, uh, for me too, for me too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, these early experiences, do they influence your work? of today and in the last decades? Well, yes, they do. They do, and increasingly so. Oh, there, that's, there were, why increasing? That's interesting. Yes, why because increasingly there so? were maybe 20 years after I entered the architecture school when I was trying to get away from that mental home. But after that, I have become increasingly inclined to return back to that. The mental home. Mental home. Oh, that's interesting. What can you say a few words about this mental home? Well, for exactly you? the kind of uh, uh, personal archetypal feeling of uh, of being home and and the place of home, oh. which which is much more a mental thing than a physical thing. And in that sense, we. We, uh, as I said, we carry our home with us. Somehow the idea of, of the home and the experience of that. So here's a question for you, following to this idea. We look at something, we experience architecture or art or anything. Let's stick to architecture. And all we feel about what we see is within us. Okay. Within the beholder, as they say. Clear. We see, you see, everybody sees, and we see different things or whatever. Is there something in the thing himself, imminent? 
or is it only that these things are dead, architecture is dead, only when we look at it, it becomes something? Is this what you just said, or would you change uh, this? You are, you are now coming to John Dewey's uh, <laughs> idea of experience, of course. Uh, Who was that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I our, our common friend. We has to talk? Jean Dewey. Jean Louis? Uh, okay, doesn't matter. Yes. Okay, <laughs> go on, go on. You will tell me later who that was. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, no, the it it is constituted in the in the experience. It's a it's a men mental thing. It, it's uh, something that is uh, between the space could, and and, and yeah. your mind and your memory and your expectations. So could you? Maybe this is too imposing, but could you say, I think, because you say, like, it is. If you say this, I would have to say, no, I don't believe like that. But it, like this, so you say, together with many others, it's in us, it's in you. There's nothing in the object itself. Yes, it's between between the object and and and, and, no. and me, no. like um, our mutual interest uh, atmosphere. It's something that's suspended between the space and, no. and, and the experience. No. I want. I don't. I try once more. I would like to. <laughs> piece of a piece a work of architecture a building a building can the building have a presence without any human being looking at it now i got you this is my question or this only this has <laughs> no presence at all and i look at it and now it has a presence what do you think well your question is a very <laughs> <laughs> theoretical question you were you, you don't like that uh, notion but uh, i don't think it has a presence uh, because the presence is uh, is uh, a human value a human experience that okay. constitutes that value okay do you disagree with me i would like to disagree with you you would like to yeah. <laughs> <Please do Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm I'm not so sure about it. So the build what I know about this, what I think I know, not from books or to, 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 for me from myself, there must be a special quality in the art, in the building which makes me feel like that. So there is something there, and this I can see, because many buildings don't do this for me. And it doesn't help if anybody tells me they should. If they don't, they don't. That's, I'm not, like everybody is like that, I guess. But there are these buildings doing this, and I start to react, I experience beauty, or a sense of home, or and so, so there must be something there. Even if I'm not looking, but I'm not sure. Mm. That's why I say well, I would like to disagree with you, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, well, I follow your thought. Uh, uh, a, a piece of architecture or art that speaks to me needs to have specific uh, characteristics or qualities built into it in order to evoke my interest in the first place and particularly my admiration and, and emotions and perhaps a, a strong uh, identification in the final end so that in the most uh, rare cases I have a a tear in my eye. Yeah, so it has to speak to you. A good work of art, a good building has to speak to you. Yes, it is a dialogue. It's a, it's a kind of a dialogue between uh, the observer and, and the work. 
So for a dialogue needs two, right? It needs two. One is alive, the other one is dead. Okay, now I stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, I think for me, it's. I often ask myself, of course. Uh, the more I think, uh, it's your half an hour. I ask you. Mm. Do you know? Have you experienced moments of? Presence. Does this the word presence uh, say anything? Is this important? Say anything to you? Presence. Yes, it's very important. It's it's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people have presence. Uh, ideas have uh, have presence. Beauty. The uh, experience of beauty has presence. Uh, works of architecture and art. They they have a presence and the. Presence is a very uh, essential thing, uh, which doesn't at, at all uh, depend on the apparent uh, sort of uh, power of the work. Uh, for me, uh, some of the works that are most present are Morandi's uh, paintings, which oh, really? I know you also uh, like. Uh, uh, uh. And they, they have an extraordinary presence in, in you know, this, this size. And uh, in this case of Morandis, what makes the presence there for you? How could you explain this? Well, get close I, to I would it? say they are not pictures of something. They they are worlds. Um, Morandi has a beautiful sentence. Uh, um, he says uh, the. The most abstract is uh, abstract of all is reality. So the most abstract is the I mean, most the most abstract is the most concrete. Yes, exactly. Yes, oh, okay, which I understand. sounds like a paradox, but it is a very interesting view into what reality and and uh, and uh, abstraction uh, are and what. Uh, yes, a very essential thing. I never understood actually what this is abstraction because of that. Yeah. Because if I start, uh, start to think about abstraction, it becomes incredibly concrete. Then I ask my friend, the philosopher, and it gets even more complicated, then I stop. Mm. It they seem to belong together, these two things. For me, I don't know more, but I agree completely with what you say. So, the work of art, Morandi, represents a world, depth. And you read this as a human being with everything you know and everything you have experienced. Yes, because uh, a, a great piece of art is an invitation. Uh, it invites uh, your emotions, your understanding, your experiences, and a little piece of Morandi, it becomes a world. And um, this reminds me of what uh, uh, Tarkovsky in his uh, oh. Sculpting in Time says, uh, an artistic image is, is not uh, a, uh, an idea of the artist, it is a world, it's an entire world as reflected in a drop of water. No, nice. That's no. what also Morandi species are. To you, what they were... Me, know, yes, yeah, and yeah. I would uh, guess that uh, they are for anyone who appreciates them. Who knows? For you, they are. Yeah, yeah. For you, they are. That's the important part, I guess. So how is this? Do you think this kind of feelings, or we go back to this feeling for looking at work, work of art, also and mostly in architecture, has something to do with the past, with the history, with history, with the things which happened before, right now? Shall I, I ask again? Do you think this feeling 
this is a piece of art, this, I have tears in my eyes, profound feelings, is this, has, is this in the present only, or has it to do with your past? Well, all memorable pieces of art, for me, they, they are, uh, they have a depth, a historical depth. Historical depth. Yes. Uh, of their own in, in the human culture, but they also uh, evoke the history uh, in, in your own own character. Uh, your Biographical. Own Biographical, yes. No, no, no. I agree. But uh, but doesn't matter whether I agree or not. I, I didn't want to say this. <laughs> what I want. <laughs> I would like to go to architecture and ask you from there. What's your relationship as a architect to the history of architecture to old buildings? Uh, it has changed, I can, I can tell you. Have you been brought up in modernistic traditions? Yes, I was more brought up in, in that tradition. I had a very good history teacher, but uh, in the late 50s and 60s, we did not care for history. <laughs> I have uh, learned to care later. And uh, now history is very important for me because uh, uh, wisdom is something which is, must be layered. Uh, there is uh, very little uh, ad hoc, uh, you know, wisdom. It always has a temporal depth and uh, that one can ex experience and, and read yeah. in, in, yeah. in, in all things. Sure. And uh, I have become also a believer in, in the wisdom of tradition, which uh, uh, I neglected and, and uh, my generation or two or three generations of modernists neglected. Question. In my case, I was also trained in modernist tradition. We always had to invent. Innovation was the top goal of every design. Yes. You could not use it, it was completely impossible, but it was innovative. Mm. Then you were close to a good grade, right? This was how it was. Today, but now if you do your personal answer, Designing today, we are not modernists uh, anymore. We are not live in a different time, but you have to do a new building. How could we integrate a feeling for the past in a new building? Can you talk about that? I didn't quite understand yeah. it. Um, can, can I, I try to rephrase it. Uh, we didn't look at the history at the time, okay? Maybe today, or you do, yes. you said, as a designer, how should you deal with the past yes, of the yeah, discipline? Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, I used to think in the modernist way that uh, art and architecture were uh, primarily invention. I don't think so anymore. Uh, I think they are a conversation with the past much more than, than uh, you know, a futuristic oh. in interest. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, after having learned that through my personal experience, uh, my, uh, my uh, important teachers have uh, become uh, artists and architects who have maybe died 100 years or 500 years ago. And that's the fantastic uh, quality of uh, the, the human culture and art, is that uh, you can, you know, uh, deal with 
phenomena that is uh, hundreds year, hundred years old or even 25,000 years old, thousands, like the cave yes, paintings, no. and they are so real as anything, our conversation right here now. Well, That's the magic of art. No, no, I agree. We're not the first ones. No. <laughs> uh, I hope we are not the last ones either. <laughs> Let's see. We can work on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there a work of architecture which comes to your mind, which uh, tries to do this, and where you think, I can see this in a good or whatever way, that the work of architecture tries, with, how do you say, to dialogue with the past? Well, I would say, instead of giving example, uh, examples, I would say that, in my understanding, <laughs> every uh, profound architect or artist deals with, uh, with uh, the past and the tradition, the, the thick time of the past, yeah. because that's the source of wisdom and, and okay. meaning also. Meaning okay. is not something that can be invented, it has to be rediscovered. It's in the human being and its historical historicity. Oh. What meaning is? Oh, I understand. Uh, oh. uh, so I, I can say that in my personal case, I have changed my views a hundred percent since oh. my youth. You included the past tradition of art and architecture and so into your work and thinking. Not not only that into my into my consciousness or, or feeling of the world, it's not today, it's a thick uh, presence wow. of things. Okay. And presence, you said, huh? Oh, good. I yeah. used your word. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't steal it, we know it from a long time. I love the word. So it's this presence. And how does it feel to live with this presence? Well, you, the, the world of art, including architecture, is, is a magical thing because uh, you can momentarily feel through, you know, the sensitivity of Vermeer, for instance. Mm -hmm. When you really look at the painting in a museum like a Vermeer, uh, in Delft, uh, uh, when you concentrate on it, you feel first that you are looking at the painting like the, the uh, view of Delft with the yellow spot that uh, Proust uh, comments on. You feel that you are looking uh, uh, behind the painter, but then uh, five minutes later, you become Vermeer. And, or Vermeer and looks at you. Yeah. That's also the case, yes. Yeah. And this okay. is the power, the magic of the, yeah. of the work. Yeah. So since it is half hour, this goes so quickly, we could go on, even though we don't have a fire here in the back, a fireplace. Uh, I, this one question of many here, I didn't ask, right? Hmm. That one thing before we change the roles. I would like to ask. <laughs> now he is preparing a dangerous list here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, my last question to you. Um, is it true? I have the feeling that you often use metaphors to describe qualities of architecture. Is this true? Do I have the correct impression you, that you use metaphors sometimes? Yeah, yes, uh, we, we communicate through language and uh, words are metaphoric already. They, they, they are from a different ground and built uh, Spaces. I would know some poets who would completely disagree with you, but I know what you're saying, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, well, 
I'm not using metaphors uh, for, uh, for any other purpose than trying to concretize mm. an experience or a feeling, oh. to give it a verbal, uh, communicable shape. So they are important to you to communicate? Yes, they are. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. So thank you. <laughs> 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 I need a sauna after this. <laughs> now comes the easy part for you. <laughs> yes, we have known each other 23 years, I think. This is not the first time we talk to each other. But the, uh, it, uh, uh, this is uh, an unrehearsed, uh, an un, uh, how would I say, planned conversation anyway. The first time I heard a lecture from you was at the Alvarado Symposium in Uvascula right. in 95. And um, I remember your lecture particularly because uh, it... Uh, did not have any of the characteristics of a normal architect's talk. Like tonight. You spoke about uh, <laughs> little uh, situational observations or experiences of light and space and, uh, and intimacy and so forth, uh, which uh, was uh, curious to me. Nowadays, uh, 23 years after, I understand very well your, your approach, but um, for instance, you might, uh, might have spoken of uh, a specific light in a specific situation. And uh, my question is, this seems as if you would uh, ground your architectural thinking on situations rather than uh, uh, geometric or uh, e entities or ideas of that so sort. This reminds me of um, my professor Aulis Blumstedt uh, in the early 60s, often in his lectures, he said, it is more uh, for an architect, a more important uh, area of talent is to imagine human situations than fantasize spaces. So, did, did, did your, uh, you know, talk, the whole uh, essence of it, uh, uh, focus on, on such elements of su human situations rather than architecture as a pre-given uh, idea? Okay. Now, first, I have to ask you... <laughs> <laughs> Could you make out of this, you said, which I understood well, but it's so many things. Mm -hmm. Could you make just select one simple question for me? <laughs> just one. I understand the complexity of what you're talking, but for me it would be easier if you pick something easy for me, okay? Is, is your architectural thinking grounded on specific human situations? What I do in architecture comes first, and my thinking about architecture comes second. First, I'm a maker. I like to do things. And then I like to listen to what the people want. I like to understand it and also like to question it with them together. And the same thing with the place. I look, what is the place? What does it demand from me? Do I like it? Would I like and so on? And my, I, my approach is not thinking, designing. My approach is studying the task and then design. your office in Hallerstein only once 
But when I did that, I was, uh, uh, I paid attention to your models, uh, which were placed on a, a your eye height, and they were a very realistic models, uh, almost true. like stage sets, with <laughs> human beings, furniture and everything, uh, as if you were casting a human situation, uh, casting a theater right. piece, rather than a, a dead space. So uh, could you uh -huh, yeah, say something? Yeah, Why sure. do you work that way? I'm inter extremely interested to, to create spaces which work well and are full of atmosphere, which people would say, this is a good garage, or this is a good movie theater, or this is a beautiful kitchen. So they, uh, that's, uh, if somebody says this, this is uh, the best compliment I can get. So <laughs> that's, what, that's all I do, actually. Try, do you see, you saw this correctly, trying to imagine how will it be? Will I like it? Will, will it be, will everything be tuned? So in German we would say, stimmt das, ist das stimmungsvoll, etc., etc., nice words in German for this. Uh, so you're right, this is what I do, and I have to do the models for two reasons. First of all, my young collaborators hardly draw anymore, these are on the machine, and the machine doesn't have a scale, as we know. So for there, I introduced the models to have uh, reintroduced the scale into the work. And the other thing is that I, my imagination of, of space is not so bad, but I see much more in the model. Mm. Much more, because there's so many things. Well, I'm, I'm specifically in interested in the realism uh, of your models uh, and uh, because uh, the, the, the more, more normal uh, <laughs> you know architectural yeah. the method of architect yeah. working would be going towards abstraction but whereas you seem to uh, hold on to, to the reality of things and you also in one of your in in the lecture oh uh, no no it's in the atmospheres book one of the subtitle is the magic of the real uh, can you no, talk um, something about the magic of the real? Yeah. The, I think there's, for me, there's nothing better than sitting in the kitchen on the corner bench and the light is right and I hear the birds and I can make a coffee and my children come in and so on. And I can this, of course, transform to, uh, to churches and other things we're trying to do. I try to find the name atmosphere, or the, which sort of in, tries to encompass the whole thing, which is not only the forms, as you know, but it, it's the substance of the materials, it's to, the, the togetherness of the materials, how the light falls onto the materials and is reflected in the space, and the sound and all of these things. So that's uh, my passion. But what was the question at the beginning? I lost it. What, what, well, it what, did was I about it? the magic of the real. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there is, I think... Wood, stone, concrete, and all these, I mean stone, 5,000 uh, types of stone, and treating stone and putting the stone into the light here or there or there and so on. So I think I'm completely fascinated when I'm in this uh, National Romantic Hotel uh, here in the here. I can see this architect, I would have, uh, what's his name, you know this guy? I would have liked to meet him because I'm sure he was interested in the same things. You have these dark rooms, you know, you come in, everything is paneled, and then you go somewhere else. That's my world. That's the magic of the real. Mm -hmm. The architectural space is a void, but everything around I can influence. Yes, um, Alberto Giacometti, your countryman, has a beautiful sentence when he says uh, that uh, uh, the task of the art artist is not to imitate reality, 
but to create a reality uh, of the same intensity. I think it's a, uh, I like that idea very much. Uh, uh, how would you react to this uh, idea? I like it very much too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the essence, isn't it? <laughs> That's what we, we, should, we all should be trying to do. Yeah. Did, did you ever? <laughs> did you ever meet uh, Giacometti, by the way? You he could died. Have. I'm from Basel, so he was where I live now. That's where he grew up, and he died in Kur a year before I arrived there, so I never met him. Mm. He, he's, he has become one of my, the great heroes for, for me, a really genuine human, I human can being, understand, I must I say. Can yes. understand. Yeah. But you know, every evening he was going out from bar to bar, so you know that part also? Yes. You like that also? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, um, in... Uh, your book, uh, Atmospheres, you, uh, I think you argue or say that you don't begin your work or base your work on any, any theoretical ground, but then you say also that you like to think about uh, what architecture is and yeah. what it means to you. Can you uh, elaborate this, uh, you know, yeah. uh, Gladly. duality? Yeah. If, I do, if I have to do something, I think everybody knows this. My emotions and my intuition helps me more. Because obviously my intuition knows a lot. My brain doesn't uh, know. My intuition is somewhere in the body, like yours and everybody else's, knows a lot. And so I like to trust this and go there and see what comes up. I go to the site or I do something. I have images come up. Everybody knows this. So I'm very careful also with the... Uh, my young collaborators coming from the university that they have to stop this rationalization. They cannot say this anymore. Uh, they just have to emotionally react. And it's interesting that if you, if you are allowed to have an emotional reaction to a form or to a solution we're working on or to something, they don't like it like it, love it, but I don't know why, and that's it. Then I like to start to think about this. Why the heck do I love this? And then I start to use my brain. And My observation is if it's the other way around, that first my brain starts, I cannot uh, resource to my emotions anymore. My brain is is like the big boss up there and telling this and this and this. I remember the worst designs in school, in art school for furniture and so on I made were the ones I made the biggest research. The research killed it all. Yes. Well, you, you begin your Atmospheres book uh, with a with an image of um, of the Isle of Death. Ah, the Isle of Death. The famous painting. Berkeley in the Total Incident. Ber yes, that's okay. Okay. In, your, in Basel. No, right. Yes, And you ended with another painting, uh, Antonello da uh, Messina's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. beautiful, beautiful uh, Annunciation. The, right. Uh, right. Lady uh, in a blue. Right. Ra uh, somewhat lighter blue than you have now. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. What is your relationship with uh, painting? Because uh, it's very rare to begin and end an architecture book or personal book uh, on, on paintings. Uh -huh. uh, maybe first I have to say that uh, learning about architecture, in my case, for me, I was always learning outside of architecture. Maybe that's quite similar to you. So I learned from music or I learned from uh, painting or I learned from, from art. Brooklyn's Toten Insel is like an icon. 
So there is a house, and there are the cypresses and the island. And, and the blackness in the center. And the black is in the center, and there is this light. And so, and I have to say, I like this if, a com if there is a composition of something, which we call this uh, in German Stillleben, and in English, how is it called? The still life? Maybe? Still life. Okay. Uh, so I like this Stillleben kind of thing, and things come together. I like to make pieces of architecture which have the same quality of being, look at this, and now this is clear and strong. So, and in Brooklyn's Totendienst, apart from other things, of course, I can see this, okay? Isn't also the island itself almost like, like a Morandi painting? It's a still life which, uh -huh, yeah, uh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. expresses the island. <laughs> so of death. I can see you like it too, right? Yes, <laughs> With <do>. your Morandi <laughs> background. <laughs> no, I can see I that. I also <laughs> like the, the uh, Antonello da Messina. Uh, why, painting. why do you like that painting? Well, the, the uh, woman is just fantastically beautiful. Uh, Isn't she? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's not, not, in a, not in an erotic sense, but something... Uh -huh. You know something other, uh, but um, I also think of another Antonello da Messina painting, Hieronymus uh, in his study, uh, which, yeah, which right. is an uh, archetypal image of uh, architecture. And you speak of uh, intimacy. Yeah. Uh, one of the sub chapters in your book, uh, uh, Atmospheres, yeah. is on intimacy. Right. Would, could you speak on intimacy in architecture? I didn't answer the question about why is this the Blue Annunciato in the book. You want to hear it? I'm going to yes, tell yes, you. Yes, yes, I thought you <laughs> wanted to escape it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Very considerate of you. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, when I saw this painting for the first time, I've never seen it in real. I haven't been down in the south. I still want to do this. Just uh, as, a, as, a, as a photo, as a reproduction, I was stricken by this amazing beauty and by this a woman that you exactly like you who she is not erotic she's somehow more than this it's uh, I could compare it maybe that uh, there's the composer Bach who can translate words into music and then I say yes exactly God Damn it, how can this guy do this? That is it, it the hair is full bekümmernis and the music says exactly this. Mm -hmm. And there I have a strong feeling, and maybe it has also to do with uh, I hate to say it, but we should always say the truth, so I say it. I think it has to do with the figure of a mother, somebody who looks for me and is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. like that. Yes, the the blue color itself is mem memorable, and, yeah. and so are the uh, motions of the hand, two hands, uh, yeah. uh, enigmatic somehow. And I put it there, of course, as my personal image of beauty. In the same same book, uh, you have pictures of architecture. One is a uh, railway station by uh, uh, yeah. Pope. Yeah, right. And then uh, there's uh, an, uh, an image of a student cafe in Zurich. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, would you explain uh, or tell yeah, us glad. why <laughs> do you choose architect uh, rather surprising examples uh -huh. of great architecture? Uh, this black and white... Uh, uh, image from the Cafe Odeon in Zurich. Yes. With smoke, cigar, With smoke, cigarette smoke. This is, I think, this is sort of in, uh, young intellectuals and uh, sitting in this famous cafe, talking. But it's uh, not a very good time. World Wars, World War uh, One uh, has just been, I think. So it's not a very good time. But it's something fantastic that this space and the tables and the chair and these guys there in their clothes and this space and the smoke, which I think a perfect place 
Cafe Odeon, I would have liked to be there. Must have been a perfect place. So by always my same uh, longing for this uh, something which is uh, like full and rich. Okay. Uh, the other thing has to do with history. I was well in America. I had the possibility to uh, buy volumes, big volumes called Lost America. And then I started to look through these things and you see and Lost America, where all these buildings and all the volumes are lost. And they are so well made. They, you can see there have been masons working on facades and there have been windows. Incredible, beautiful details. It comes to my mind when I'm here in the hotel in your National Romantic pieces, which in, in times are really well made. Mm -hmm. And so this, and then there's also, the, and there is this railway station, so perfect, gone. So I, this has to do, I would like to pay a reference to the people, to the craftsmen and the architects who did such beautiful things. In that same book you have one image of uh, Le Corbusier, uh, the Sarabhai house in Ahmedabad. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, would you explain why you selected uh, Le Corbusier? And, uh, I'm asking this because uh, a month ago I... You were there. Uh, <laughs> no, yes, and I, I talked with... Uh, Doshi, uh, yeah, Krishna uh, Doshi, who's uh -huh. 90 years old, and uh, he worked on the uh, Corbusier yeah, projects yeah, in right, Ahmedabad. Right, right. It's an intimate space. It's surprisingly low. It works with volts. It works with colors. It's not big, has a, not, not really big, it's an intimate space. It has a fantastic depth. It's a reference to Le Corbusier, I adore. I, of course, I didn't meet him, but whenever I uh, encounter a building of his, I feel something I feel also for like Palladio buildings. When I go there, I think there was this guy, he knew everything, how it goes and went and how it felt, and now I do this. And I think Corbusier was obsessed also to get this right. And what's fantastic, I show you. My notes here, they are in this, this book. You know the Cabano, oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, I've been there last uh, summer. And what I was touched, what got to me when I touched is he made drawings of this small piece of shack where he was or hut or so, with the same dedication and precision like for Chandigarh. So I'm a complete fan of uh, Corbusier. And again, there in this image, I saw this amazing quality that it's a haptical, physical presence quality to me. Are we done? Let, let, let me, before we huh? end, let me ask you okay. a, uh, we must a last done. question which okay. uh, deals with your beginning. Yeah. Uh, you started uh, 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 as an assistant to uh, master cabinet maker. And in your uh, lecture in uh, Jyväskylä at the Al Alvaralta Symposium, you have a little uh, glimpse of your w work there, and then uh, you are describing how you built your first pieces of uh, furniture that you uh, had yeah, designed too. yourself. <laughs> I forgot about that. A bed <laughs> and a cupboard. Right. And you describe wonderfully the precision that you were able to achieve in, in your cupboard when you describe the tight fit of the door, which <laughs> closed yeah. with a kind of a uh, sound of yeah. air. <laughs> right. uh, can you tell us what um, you have uh, uh, gained from uh, your cabinet maker background? I'm asking this particularly because 
uh, still in my, my days, each one of us worked on construction sites. Each one of had uh, a personal sure. relationship with work, but it, is, it has disappeared. So would you say something on this? I was forced to do this. My father wanted this, so I hated it. But looking back, I can see that I learned something in these four years. And I learned that you can make, that I can make objects, and I can give to these objects a very specific quality. That this kind of tight fit where the air hardly can come out, this was this uh, discovery, empiric discovery, like many, many other things later. Particularly <laughs> tell of your interest in the undersides, the invisible parts, the quality of the invisible parts. Yeah, I, don't, uh, I, <laughs> I don't really know where these things come from. Not from my father, because he was making everything cheap you didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was protest to him, but I don't actually don't think so. I'm like that, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you certainly have a sense of uh, quality. I remember when we spent uh, a few days in Uvascula in the uh, jury, uh, you had to bring your own cigars because we couldn't find good enough cigars in Finland. <laughs> Let's see what comes today. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we decided there would be no questions, but... You said I could give one, uh, yeah, okay. so please. <laughs> and, and, and since I do feel with the future of Finnish architecture that is sitting out there, uh, we live in a distracted world and, and, and it's difficult to focus. What advice would you give? You but, but both of you. <laughs> advice to advice. young coming architects? In my view, architecture has become too uh, professionalistic in orientation. Architects are increasingly uh, working and looking like lawyers and, uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, engineers. I think uh, my advice, uh, that is a wrong orientation architecture is something else it's a humanistic and human endeavor uh, and as I said earlier it our task is to continue a tradition to make sure that there is not break in in the history of uh, you know human uh, wisdom I would say so my advice would be go back to when uh, art and architecture were still, you know, uh, autonomous, not part of the com commercial establishment and part of the, the uh, uh, how would I say, sick uh, competition uh, of visibility uh, in, in the society. And I always tell my Students everywhere don't ever go to bed without having at least four good books next to your head on the night table. Uh, wisdom is in the books, not uh, in, in the, you know, these de devices. <laughs> okay, four books. <laughs> good advice. So this is, of course, uh, a big question. This would fill the next lecture, uh, next talk. Uh, what I see is that in most of the schools of architecture, all over the, the ones I know of, architects are trained to be artists and small geniuses and, uh, and so on. 
and when they go back to the field, they encounter a com commercial world where you have to perform within uh, the economy and, and the givens and so on, and this doesn't come together. So we would have to talk about then how what, what's happening in the world, you know? Is it now a few architects who can work like that, like the old uh, artistic, uh, skillful architect? Uh, and the rest uh, just are facade planners and floor plan layouters and so on. Okay, I don't know. But I can go back and say, I think it's interesting, it would be good if Every architect, let's, I put it like that, architects who come to my office, they should all have worked for one year at least with their hands somewhere. I like that if somebody has a competence, whatever, knitting or, or rebars or something, but doing some a knowledge of the hand, I believe in this. And the other thing would be, don't believe everything they say, they tell you, the professors. Use your own uh, head, try to be yourself sometimes. But this is dangerous <laughs> because then I have to don't be conceited, don't be an egotist and so on. That, so this, being, this is difficult by being yourself, but I mean it. So learn reading, thinking, intelligent of the hand, and then I said this two years ago and three years ago, and when I read it afterwards in the interview, it always felt somehow wrong. And then last year I told somebody to the same question, I think the architect should all design buildings, they a good friend of the, uh, actually what I said is, their mother would like. <laughs> and now this was written and now the people came back, it was wrong again. <laughs> so I gave up. <laughs> you will find out yourself.